Long time Circus Peace Council person, founder of the Circus Cultural Workers, co parent, and activist. I think this is a cool. I'm going to stand up at least for a little while. Um, so I thought I could talk a little bit about the history of the war. And uh, then I brought along the, uh, actually the best visual compilation of resistance to the war uh, that, that I know of. And that's the calendar that the Peace Council published and I coordinated in 19. After the war ended, I was just thinking about that. We actually must have worked that whole summer on it. Because it's the 76 calendar and the war ended in, in uh, April 30th of 75. So as a calendar publisher, that was not a big window. <laughs> a little louder. What's that? A little louder. A little louder? OK. Uh, how's that? Yeah. Uh, so I think it's important to understand the carnage that, that Vietnam represented. I mean, you know, we hear quite a bit about the killings in in uh, Ukraine today and, and the carnage, the dest destruction. Uh, Vietnam was exponentially greater than that. Uh, three million people were killed in Vietnam alone. Three million people died. Uh, and in Laos and Cambodia, uh, approximately another two million were, were killed. And about 10 to 15 million people were internally displaced in those countries. And that does not even include things like the Agent Orange defoliation in approximately half of North Vietnam was defoliated, uh, rendering it impossible to grow crops, you know, congenital diseases, both in terms of the Vietnamese people and also the US GIs who were who were involved in ground fight. Okay, so um, the war, I mean, let's back up just a little bit. Uh, Ho Chi Minh, who is considered the father of Vietnam, if you have not heard of him, which you may not have, um, uh, began, founded the Viet Minh in 1941. And the Viet Minh was a nationalist and a communist organization committed to freedom and independence for Vietnam. Uh, at the time, uh, Vietnam and Indochina in general were under the control of the French. Uh, it was called French Indochina. Uh, the, so eventually, you don't need all these details, but eventually uh, the Viet Minh waged war against the French to drive them out and they defeated them at the NBN Fu in 1954. Uh, and of course the French vastly outgunned, you know, the Vietnamese, but the Vietnamese still won. They were fighting for their country. And just as the Ukrainian people are fighting for their country, uh, and that makes an incredible difference in the, in the ability of people to resist. Uh, another interesting fact that you of course will never hear about the Viet Minh is that during World War II, uh, the only reliable ally the U.S. had in Indochina in that whole area was the Viet Minh. Uh, the French were essentially collaborating with the, with the Japanese by and large in many ways because it was to their economic advantage. Uh, so on the one hand, the Viet Minh, the main thing they did was they rescued U.S. downed fighters, fighter planes, uh, which was, you know, uh, an important part of the war effort at that point. Um, so in 1956, um, the Geneva Convention was held. Uh, and at that convention, the US and Southern Vietnam did not sign it, but they agreed to abide by it. Uh, the country was to be divided in two parts, temporarily, and elections were then to be held uh, as soon as possible. Uh, ZM, who was installed in, 
as the puppet dictator in South Vietnam by the United States at that time, refused to hold the elections. Of course, the United States was pulling the strings. Uh, and wasn't doing anything that the US didn't really want. Um, refused to hold the elections. Um, and later, Dwight D. Eisenhower, uh, who was the president at that time, said that the reason the US didn't want to hold the elections is because Ho Chi Minh would have won in the landslide. Uh, and uh, so what you have here is a, an external military force imposed, trying to impose its will on a people uh, and, and, then, and then camouflaging it by saying, we're, we're fighting for the democracy of the South, which is just bullshit. So uh, resistance to the war gradually built up the first demonstrations against the war, which were organized by traditional peace groups in the United States, War Resistance League, AFSC, uh, SANE, were held in 1965. Um, and from that point on, the resistance just continued to build domestically. Uh, and then in approximately 67 and 68, um, well, actually, 67 was a, was a pivotal thing. Uh, Muhammad Ali refused the draft in 1967 and basically said that the Vietnam War was, uh, you know, was immoral, was illegal, and he was not going to... His famous line was, no Vietnamese ever called me nigger. And that actually became uh, an anthem, sort of particularly of black soldiers in Vietnam. Uh, there was a movie made of that title. Uh, that we actually carry at the Peace Council and distribute it. Um, so gradually, um, resistance domestically was building and resistance within the military was building. Uh, and you don't hear anything about that now. Um, the, uh, I always say, and I should perhaps have started there, that there are three reasons the war ended. One reason was the incredible resistance of the Vietnamese people against overwhelming, overwhelming firepower. Um, and the second reason is the resistance in the military in the United States. Um, by, I think it was about 1970 or 71, a colonel finally said in a military paper, and they've been trying to cover this up for years, I'm sure, that if the United States didn't end its involvement in Vietnam, the army was going to collapse. U.S. Army was going to collapse. Uh, just, I don't know if people have heard of any of these kinds of things, but fragging was very common in the military, and that meant, you know, enlisted or drafted soldiers were actually attacking their commanding officers, sometimes killing them. Um, drug use was almost totally pervasive, and essentially whole platoons, whole regiments were not fighting forces any longer in Vietnam. By the, by the early 70s. So, um, and then the third reason is the resistance of in the United States and resistance around the world by civilians, uh, which was also extensive. Uh, and the more there was collaboration between civilians and, and the people in the military, the harder the government tried to stop that, suppress that. Um, and it's hard to imagine some of these things, but they were literally, um, all around the world where there were U.S. bases, and as you know, there are U.S. bases everywhere around the world, uh, coffee houses sprang up that were committed to supporting GIs who were resisting the war. Uh, and of course, the government tried to, you know, squash those coffee houses, but, you know, they closed one and another would open. Uh, it was completely unsuccessful. Um, so, uh, the internal things in Vietnam were also going on at the same time. You know, there was incredible resistance in the South to the, to the various puppet regimes that the United States installed. Um, very little of that information, you know, got to the U.S. public. Um, the atrocities did, however, get to the, the U.S. public, and people have probably have seen some of those. You know, the picture of the, of the girl running down the road who has, who has been exposed to napalm. Um, the assassination by a, I think a CIA agent actually in Saigon of a, of a suspected uh, NLF 
soldier, you know, shot him in the head with, and it was reported, you know, on tele national television. Uh, so those things, you know, the fact that the that the Pentagon had not realized that that uh, allowing the media to televise the war was not in their interests. Uh, they learned after that, after the war, to, to not allow that any longer. So you, you, the media coverage you get now is nothing like what it was during Vietnam. Uh, this this whole concept of embedding reporters, you know, it's, it's kind of like double speak for, well, you do what you're told and you can stay. If not, you're out of here. Uh, so uh, 1971, um, well, 1970 was Kent State and Jackson State. And I'll actually show you this. Can you look at the slide behind? Okay. Maybe we could play the Ohio song. Um, Kent State, Ohio. So this is the piece that we did for, for Kent State and Jackson State. And essentially the point we we're trying to get across was uh, Kent State made massive moves. Don't know what Kent State did. Uh, there was a protest going on at the Kent State University campus. And the National Guard was called in by a relatively conservative and reactionary governor. And they ended up killing four students and injuring another 16 at Penn State. And then 14 days later at Jackson State, which is in Mississippi, um, students were protesting again, predominantly black students. And two students were killed and 30 were wounded. That did not make any national news whatsoever. Uh, so we decided to kind of Point that out uh, in this piece. And, you know, this. So just hold it up higher. There you go. That's good. Or just a little higher. <laughs> okay. So, okay. so we're going to play this song by Crosby Seals National Young called Ohio. And I was in school at Syracuse at the time. And we were protesting and stuff. And when the murders happened in Kent State, that's when things got really hot and we took over the whole university. So this song came out soon after that. It was a very important song to kind of move people forward about who are dead and who are high, you know, because it brought it close. So we thought it'd be good to just play it. Um, yeah, I don't know the percentage, but a very high percentage of universities, again, hard to understand, hard to. to to comprehend this in this day, closed in the United States. They simply closed because the students were on strike. And uh, many, many faculty members of course supported it. And Circuit uh, University was kind of late to, I think it eventually closed. Yeah, it did. Yeah, but it was not one of the first ones to close. Um, and at the same time, there was sabotage going on in the United States. Uh, ROTC buildings were being attacked um, and various other activities were going on in terms of anti-military. You know. In other words, what I'm saying is it wasn't simply uh, demonstrations in the street, although there were massive demonstrations in, you know, across the country going on. What's that? Draft resistance. Draft resistance being one of them, yes. Uh, I mean, the, the the government, it, by this time, by the early 70s, was having a hard time finding enough bodies to send to Vietnam. Uh, and the draft had been, when it first started out, it was more or less a, you know, if you didn't have a college deferment, then you were liable to get the draft. And then they instituted a lottery to try to make it fairer. Um, and so everybody was kind of, oh, I hope I get a high lottery number, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, so it's, I guess the, you know, all of these things were going on at the same time. It's hard to sort of comprehend it. Um, and uh, eventually um, by 1973, the 
No, no, I want to talk a little bit about 1971, I guess. 1971 was a really pivotal year also. Um, the Dewey Canyon action by, by uh, military vets happened in Washington, D.C. It was an incredibly moving and powerful demonstration. About a thousand vets came to Washington and threw their medals on the steps of Congress as a protest of the war. Very moving. Not a lot of media coverage. Can't imagine why. Um, and uh, also in 71, there was the May Day action, uh, which at, at which 14,000 people were arrested in Washington, D.C., the largest mass civil disobedience in U.S. history. Uh, essentially, the city was shut down for three days. Washington was not functioning for three days because of it. There was also a war crimes tribunal that BVAW, Vietnam Veterans Against the War, had become a significant organization by this time. <clears throat> and some of you probably heard of Iraqi, the Iraq Veterans Against the War, a direct offshoot of Vietnam Veterans Against the War. Did your friend talk about yourself? Yeah. Okay, let me get to the end of the door. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. By calling you hang in there to Vietnam a little bit longer, though I don't spend too long. Whole albums like this with Crossy Stills and Ashton Young were around anti war social justice and freedom coming out. Um, it was an amazing time culturally. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, we have a, I have a ton of songs that I'd like to play, but I could go back to Dick's story. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, I mean, there are so many things to talk about in terms of the opposition to the war, but um, some people may be familiar with this. Go higher. No, you didn't start right there. <laughs> <laughs> this is my thumbs up. <laughs> uh, Ronald Ray Z, uh, well, I should say, Buddhist monks began to immolate themselves in southern Vietnam as a, obviously, you know, a, an incredible protest of the war. Um, and eventually that movement came to the United States. Uh, and about 65 people immolated themselves in the United States in protest of the war over a period of five or six, seven years. Do people know what that means? Themselves. Lighting themselves on fire oh. uh, and, with, and having it, leaving information about why they're doing it. Usually having some, you know, the people there who can then interpret what they did. I don't know if Ronald Ray Z did have that or not, but in 1968, he immolated himself in front of the cathedral in downtown Syracuse. And it was just occurring to me that, you know, they're talking about, um, Changes that are hopefully going to take place in the cathedral and the, in the Columbus Monument that they're coming down. Uh, there could be a monument to Ronald Bracey. That would be extremely appropriate. Um, oh, I was going to mention the. Uh, so the one of the things that happened began to happen was a lot more collaboration between uh, student groups and, and other groups in the United States, traditional peace groups with the Vietnamese. Um, and one of the things that evolved out of that was the People's Peace Treaty, uh, which was essentially a document agreed upon by a large group of Vietnamese and a large number of organizations in the United States. Um, and uh, Essentially, it outlined, as any treaty would, what, what, how, how the war could be ended by way of a treaty. Um, and this, this is one of the visuals that was used in that campaign. We have declared peace by the Vietnam. And it was done by Vo Din, who was one of the artists in Vietnam who was creating artwork in an attempt to, to stop the war. And his parents said, we're going to do Cultural workers. So, just very quickly, I guess the, so the Paris Peace Accords were signed in 1973. 
January of 73. They stipulated that uh, the, the NLF or the PRG, which was the resistance group within South Vietnam, South Vietnamese government, such as it was at the time, and the North and the United States would all agree to these conditions. And one of them was the return of POWs to the United States, which of course had become a big political issue. These were essentially war criminals who were dropping bombs on civilians, but they sort of became heroes in the United States, at least to some people. Uh, and uh, so one of the provisions in the Paris, Paris Peace Accords was the POWs be returned. Another was that the US begin to withdraw its troops uh, from Vietnam. Within, know, within several months, it became clear that the US wasn't going to honor any of those things in the treaty. One of their tactics was to convert, was to take their military people and just to take their uniforms off and to you know, have them stay in the country and do what they've been doing, just as, as mercenaries, more or less. Um, so, so the NLF, National Liberation Front, which had been formed by a wide group of people in, in South Vietnam, began to step up its, its opposition to US presence. And eventually, uh, by, well, I'm not sure the exact date, but uh, the combination of the of all of this resistance within the within Vietnam and the fact that Congress was finally beginning to take steps to cut funding for the war, the military resistance, all of those things came together. And uh, by in April of 1975, the country was finally reunited. And of course the US media, much of the US media said, well, South Vietnam has fallen. And I always thought that was pretty, it's fallen to the Vietnamese. You know, it's their country, it's fallen to the Vietnamese. But anyway, that, that was the language that was commonly used, of course, because the communists had taken over. People who, you know, who valued their country, who wanted to be independent from outside influences. Okay, a little bit about, people can ask questions as we go along, if, if you wish, uh, that's fine. Uh, uh, my journey began in, 1965, um, I was a student at uh, Michigan State University. I had not been involved in any kind of, you know, movement activity at that point. Um, and for a variety of reasons, I decided, you know, I did a lot of reading when I got to school. I wasn't going to classes that regularly, I have to admit. Um, and I decided that now, I also went out to the West Coast and met with some people who were involved in several formal peace groups and, you know, talked about the war. And um, when I came back, I made a decision to oppose both the draft and the war. And I sent, a, I gradually sent a letter to my selected, my draft board, which was in Syracuse and said, I will, you know, I will not uh, help cooperate with anything you tell me to do. If, if an individual on the board wants to contact me and talk about this more, I'd be happy to talk to them. But I'm not, as an institution, I'm not going to honor you in any way. Um, and uh, they, of course, didn't like that all that well. Uh, and uh, eventually I had a trial in Syracuse, but the Peace Council, this was in 1966, the Peace Council was nothing like the Peace Council that it became later. It's kind of like a study group at that time. And so there was no support uh, for, for what I was doing. Uh, and uh, I was found guilty on two counts, uh, <laughs> resisting the draft and refusing to take a physical. Uh, they'd like to pile up the counts if they could. You know? And uh, was sentenced to six years in prison I ended up doing two years um, at three different federal prisons. I started out in Petersburg, Virginia, which is a youth corrections prison. And uh, then eventually I was, well, I was, I was transferred out of Petersburg uh, trying to address um, racism within the prison, actually. This black guy and I requested that we'd be in this cell block that only had two people in each cell. Um, and uh, 
the book that the guards kept had an N and a W next to every name. And, and when we saw the book, an N and a W were never in the same room. And so this black guy had to say, well, let's, let's challenge that. And this is my new after the Civil Rights Act uh, banned discrimination in any federal institution. Um, so about, I don't know, maybe just a few days after, after the request went in formally, uh, they arrested, arrested me internally. And um, I spent a couple of days in solitary and then they shipped me out to uh, Lewisburg. And that's a very common tactic within the federal prison system. You know, it takes a long time to establish trust and get respect from, from guys. And so if you're transferred out, you gotta start all over again. So, and and the, the troublemaker is removed. So, um, and I got to Lewisburg and Lewisburg is a maximum security prison in Pennsylvania. Uh, I spent about five weeks there. Um, I guess I should also say that at some point, um, uh, <laughs> I know this sounds a little odd, but I'm a pretty decent basketball player. And that really helped me in prison a great deal. It, it allowed me to get respect and to establish contact with particularly black guys who in many ways ran the prisons, you know, from a, from a prisoner standpoint. Um, and then it culminated, the third prison I was in was Allenwood, which was a camp near nearest Lewisburg, a minimum security camp that I was sent to. And um, <laughs> this guy, this other uh, protester named David Miller, who was the first guy in the United States to burn his draft card after Congress rushed through this law saying, you know, making it a federal crime to publicly burn your draft card. Um, and just coincidentally, David is also from Syracuse. Uh, and uh, he was also a basketball player. He played at Le Moyne, actually. He played some college ball. So he and I decided to organize a, uh, a basketball tournament within the joint. And uh, there were four teams, two JW teams, JWs, Jehovah's Witnesses, a lot of JWs in prison at that time. Uh, and there were actually three clear categories. There were JWs, there were Muslims, uh, and there were people like me, sort of, you know, non-ideological uh, political prisoners. Uh, and so we had four teams, two were JWs, one was a Muslim team, and one was, you know, the, my team, David and my team. Well, David and I, we couldn't agree on who was gonna be the point guard. Uh, I don't know if people know basketball, but I know Diane does. Um, and so, I eventually decided I would play on the Muslim team. And I probably was the only white guy that ever played on a, on a Muslim team in prison. I don't know that for a fact, but probably likely. Uh, and the fact that we didn't play together meant that one of the JW teams who had a, who had a guy who played college ball for four years and was about 6'4", uh, they eventually won. And uh, anyway, that's the... That's the basketball tournament story. Um, when I got out of prison, um, I, I got a job at Bristol Labs. I had to have a job in order you know, to get parole. And I stayed there for about 10 months. Um, I developed an allergy, so it gave me an excuse, reason to leave. And another very positive thing was that my parole officer was against the war, which was pretty unusual at that time. Uh, later on, it wouldn't have been so unusual. Um, and uh, so he allowed me to go to work at the Peace Council. Um, and, you know, when I talked to other resistors about that, he did what? <laughs> it was, you know, it was, he was kind of a little bit putting his job on the line, you know, in, in a sense of doing that. And then, what, 10 years later, when Andy Major, you know, was also went to court and was also convicted of just refusing to carry his draft card, or refusing to register, I think it was. Same, same parole officer. You know, we met with him and he had like a little reunion. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was pretty neat, actually. Uh, so, uh, and then, 
then the next thing I did was I went to work for the Peace Council in 1970. Uh, and uh, when I joined staff, there were two people on staff, well, two and a half people on staff. And by the time, in about two years, there were six people on staff. As the war got worse and worse and worse, and we made you know, greater and greater efforts to try to stop it. And the Peace Council actually at that time became, became one of the sort of model local peace, peace organizations in the United States. I mean, other groups would, you know, they'd get our newsletter and say, oh, that's what the Peace Council is doing. Oh, let's try that locally, you know. Um, so one of the things that happened under Nixon was that he started using the IRS as a, as a weapon. He criminalized the IRS and went after uh, organizations who were against the war that they, they were doing things that he didn't like. And the Peace Council was one of the organizations that he targeted. Um, and so the, that's why the Peace Council to this day is not tax exempt. It was taken away during the Nixon years. And uh, those of us who were on staff decided to hell with it. We're not gonna, we're not gonna fight this. We're not gonna reapply for it. We, do, we issued a release saying, this is a compliment. This is really uh, appreciating the effectiveness that we've had in terms of trying to stop the war. So I'm gonna stop there. Uh, I don't know what my time is like. Yeah. There's a song from 1965 that I know you like by Phil Wilkes, I Ain't Merchant Anymore. Mm -hmm. Can we look that up? Um, yeah. And then I know Mary has some good comments or thoughts or. But one thing that you didn't talk about was that the incredible movement of draft resistors. So much so that I don't know you have the statistics about how many. Eventually, there were so many draft sisters not you know, burning their draft cards and stuff that they couldn't even prosecute them. Mm -hmm. no. So there was an action, a nonviolent action, of thousands of people. Well, I, I'll talk a little bit about that. You know, there was an induction center in Syracuse down on South Salina Street where they would process about 100 to 200 guys weekly, and uh, one of the projects we had was. We focused on that. This is at the Peace Council. We focused on the induction center. And uh, I'm not, I didn't find this person, but somebody did. We had a mole inside the induction center. And they would, you know, buses would come from a pretty wide geographical area and bring guys down into the induction center to be processed. And we found out, we knew in advance where each bus was leaving from. Uh, and we would have people there to greet the people getting on the bus and talking to them about it. And in fact, successfully kept a number of guys from getting on the bus. And they never, as far as I know, they never found out how we knew where the buses were coming from. So that was like our, our sort of a subterfuge action. So a lot of these songs, like Phil Oates songs, were written generally, but um, really affected a lot of people around decisions about taking action and marching. Yes. Um, it wasn't so much a question as um, the way, you know, Dick said that there were, there was a lottery uh, in terms of when you would get called and it was done by birthdays. They literally stood there and they had everybody's birthday in a big thing and then say, they'd reach and then they'd say, okay, March 21st, that's number one, you're going first. And then they'd reach in again and they'd say, you know, December 12th, you're going second. And Mayor Shevin, my ex-husband um, and a choir member, um, was already doing draft counseling and had his conscientious objector um, application on file when the war started. And then they started drawing numbers and his birthday, which was February 26th, ended up being drawn as number 365. So in other words, it was the last, he would have been the last to be called. And I remember that his mother was very relieved, of course, 
but that he also felt terribly guilty. And people said, oh, great, you're, a, you're counseling conscientious objectors, but you're never going to have to go. So he lost some of his credibility as somebody who was supporting draft resistors because he was seen as somebody who'd gotten a pass. So I just always remember that story because it was purely random, you know, in terms of, of who got what number. Uh, is the song ready or something else? Go ahead. Yeah, sort of connecting with that, Mira. Uh, I, I had a lawyer in Syracuse, Ben Show. Uh, I don't know if that name is familiar to anybody. And he was a partner in one of the most prestigious law firms in Syracuse at the time. Hancock, Ryan, Chauvin, Houston. I can't remember. I can't believe I remember that. My God. Um, and um, he had been a conscientious objector, or he had, he had tried to be a conscientious objector in World War I, but they didn't have such a thing. And then after the war, he worked along with lots of other people to a lot of other people to establish CO status. And so he for months tried to convince me to apply for CO status. He just could not understand why I, I didn't want to do that. Um, and, you, you know, he'd give me these books by Teilhard Chardin, Chardin, I guess, and other people to read. And I, no, I don't think, Ben, I'm going to do that. And uh, eventually we just sort of came to an understanding. Um, and he, of course, personally knew the judge, the federal judge. And um, that's one of the reasons I got what was called a ZIP-6 which in, if you're in prison, federal prison, it, you don't consider it such a zippy thing, you know, because it, it actually, you can serve longer than if you've gotten an adult sentence. Um, there's, there's a lot of irony in the language in prison that uh, does anything but zip. One of the things that he thought was great was that when I got out and if I, if I did my parole, uh, a federal, a federal, uh, not a federal a felony conviction would be expunged from my record. That's why he thought, my lawyer thought that was a great idea. I, I didn't particularly endorse it, but I just got tired of arguing with him. And so, and I actually, I didn't have anything to do with the sentence anyway, but you know, he had talked to the judge and this is what they came up with, I think. Anyway. We ready for the song? Hello. We're going to do Phil Oaks unless you're dying to, to sing, Mara. No, no, whatever. Just tell me when. Okay. Thank you. I can't remember the exact. 60 to 65,000 US soldiers were killed in the war. And actually, that's significant spin. About double that number is the number of soldiers who actually died in the war. They, they come up with that because that direct combat deaths. So when, when you see that figure, know that it's like roughly double that. We have a question mm -hmm. from Cindy. Dick, explain to us why you didn't want the CO status. Um, I felt that it was uh, essentially cooperating with the system. Uh, I mean, it was the you know it's a selective service that kind of issued the. The CO status, you had to apply and you had to prove that you were religious and blah, blah, blah. And I wasn't religious. And I, and I, you know, already had, had kind of staked this ground that, I, that the selective service system shouldn't exist, that it was illegitimate. Um, so it made no sense for me to be applying for CO status. Um, I also felt that, you know, to some extent, you know, it was important to, to make a direct and powerful statement against the draft and against the war if possible. Um, that, that was um, kind of what uh, Pete was saying in that song. He said, I'm not a pacifist. Yeah, you have to be, a, you have to be a pacifist to be a CO. And he said, I'm not a pacifist. I would fight if we were invaded. And I think he went out of his way to make that point. Is that Barb? Barb. Barb. Sorry, Barb, she, her. I, I like Pete Seeger um, and Phil Oaks, a number of those people, uh, like Pete Seeger has another song that was very important called Way Steep in the Muddy Waters. 
uh, which we won't play it all tonight, but the big muddy, the big muddy waters, and this was about something that happened in World War II, where the enlisted men got at the general who kept pushing them on to do these awful things. This general, no, like some kind of officer. And he wrote it during Vietnam. So we all thought that he was talking, but he was very clever to say this is about World War II because the big jerk, the big, what was the big jerk pushed him on or something, was Johnson. That's what he really thought. Um, comments or thoughts or things that you went through or what, what this might bring up or comments for Dick? I would also say, which I didn't say, that. that the prison experience really was a radicalizing experience for me. You know, I got to meet guys that I never would have met in, in everyday everyday life as a white person. Go ahead, Diane. Yeah. yeah um, obviously, things are so different now with the Ukraine war and the media and the way things get spun and. But there were so many incredibly clever ways that people managed to get together. It seems like we ought to be able to do that now. And I just uh, love to hear some some thoughts about what is parallel that, that could be done. And um, yeah, any ideas around that? Well, of course, the Ukraine war is not a war that we're directly involved in. Um, right, although we are. <laughs> You know, yeah. yeah, you couldn't see my quotes. Uh, I, I did see. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think I think it's a it's a complicated question, but it, it's you know, uh, I mean, there is support for Ukraine. There's that there's that the demonstration we had in Syracuse. Uh, a number of Ukrainians didn't like the fact that the peace the peace groups were calling for you know not to recognize NATO uh, in, in the same way that the Ukrainians wanted to. And uh, I think it's, uh, I, I don't think that what's going on in Ukraine would, would ever engender the kind of thing that happened around Vietnam. I don't know if that answers your question. Diane. Yeah, the question was more about, are there lessons we can take that we could use even though it's a very, very different situation or is it just so different that we really can't? Well, I've just been, to bear. I mean, you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I've just been, I'm not sure, I'm not sure we're getting any big lessons out of it because it's, it's really this uh, sense that the U.S. hasn't done anything bad. Even the, even the progressive MSNBC is what we were watching. It was like basically, U.S. hasn't done anything bad ever, and these and these Russians, my God, they're barbarians. You know, we've never done anything like that. Which of course is just absolute crap. And uh, to me, that's in a, in a sense of trying to trying to get a balanced sense of U.S. history and a progressive sense of U.S. history, and having to work at that constantly uh, in order to overcome this amnesia that you know is convenient for the government. Convenient for the Pentagon and convenient for the corporations. We don't want to talk about any of those bad things. I mean, when's the, when's the last time you heard of military resistance? You know, it's like, uh uh, no, we don't talk about that. Well, uh, I don't know. That sounds pretty, right? It's a drag, and it's a drag. Uh -huh. so, uh -huh. the
the happiest day of your life So uh, I was, I felt blessed that, you know, considering my age, that I always knew one person who ever went there that was killed. It was a guy who went to my church. And I still remember his name, you know, all these years later, he was older than me. Because uh, they had a great name, they were 71. And um, this, I, I'm just intrigued by your whole experience. Yeah, I mean, you know, it ran ended because of the draft resistance movement and the fact that the war had become so incredibly unpopular across a, a vast swath of the population that they just, I mean, they didn't want to end the draft particularly, but they decided that this is a concession they made. Uh, and of course, now we have an economic draft. Right? In the military, because they don't have you know, resources, they don't have money. Yeah, it's not a lot different. Really? Well, I just want to know. So, I asked the question about has anything changed or what I'm saying in town. One thing about Iraq, Afghanistan, and everything else. I mean, it's just, it's just, I, I, I mean, it's, it's really, it's America. America. I just want to say, I don't know how many judges do this, but they all do this. I mean, you know, some judges now, when they have cases with, I mean, particularly black kids, uh, 18 or over. Well, you either do two years or you go in the military. Which, what do you want to do? That's very common. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody who hasn't talked to Diane? Thank you, Mike. I'm just wondering about back then. I have all these proportions, but like $40 billion, right, that we give to Ukraine. Uh, and that isn't the first amount, and it will be the last amount. And the fact that, you know, our, our country, our, you know, poverty level continues to, to go down, you know, and there's many more people in poverty, all of that stuff. And I'm sure that. The money and that would be, you know, uh, used for the military and used for, you know, for Vietnam in general. I'm sure that was a bone of contention. I'm sure that was an issue back then. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, this, that's not an issue here yet. But that has to be an issue. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that we learn, you know, that we can resurface that because that's, it's glaring. In face, so. I mean, that's one of the things that's happened with this thing, right? It's, it's like sort of a blank ticket for yeah. Yeah. the amount of money we're going to spend, the amount of equipment, military equipment we're going to send, because it's, because, I mean, it is true. The Ukrainians are resisting the, the heroic resistance against a far superior military. But we're, but it's also sort of rekindled all this militarism in the United States. Right. Oh yeah, you need more tanks. You need more. And who's making money? More money. Yeah, well, of course, we know who's making money. It's a corporation. Well, and, and, and see whether or not only money that we have been giving them, when when you look at that equipment and actually see it and learn what they actually do, yeah. to me. The amount of money that has gone into that, the amount of research to be able to finally kill somebody at, you know, five hundred miles away. Six miles for the house. Yeah, right, right, right. That's that's we've gone way beyond. But yet we don't put money into cancer. We don't put money into the things that are killing our people in general. We don't, you know, we don't try no, all, sure. all those things. Yeah. And, and the, from the basics all the way to the, to the most, uh, yeah. you know. Yeah, the Times on the front page of the whole had this big picture of the howitzer that we had sent to Ukraine that was going to change the fortunes of Ukraine because it's just, you know, the range right. is greater, blah, 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 blah. You know, the shell impact is greater. Yeah. Oh, and, okay. And there is a connection between the shootings here of our children and our people in supermarkets and that militarization and that feeling with the building up of who matters.
doesn't. And I think that um, it's time for our hopeful speech. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's really almost time to end. I don't know if there's anybody there um, at Zoom who has a comment, but uh, we were talking last night about our generation. And I mean, I would love to have more conversations about what it meant to be a teenager and a young person during those times and what the music was to us. What, because we really felt like we were making a revolution. We felt like everything, we were going to change everything. And I feel even cheery saying it, but because it seems like it's such a young child, me, you know, naive, naive. naive. But, um, and so, so then you can easily flip into now, well, we didn't, nothing happened, you know, 50 years later, what did we do? But I don't think that's true. I think that there are significant ways that my people and the people with different movements, civil rights movements, women's movements started that. Um, Holly Nair was the first person who did an album that included celebrating women, the Vietnamese women, you know, celebrating women's contributions. Um, that that current of what we did is what we, where we are today, still, still there. And if we hadn't done it, what would it be like? And say now, if we don't keep doing it, making peace, talking about this stuff, raising issues, hello, girl. Um, uh, that you know, that's hopeful, but but we we never know what how what we're doing. We can't measure it very easily, but. We, but I believe that we have to do something. Yeah, okay, time for my, time for my hopeful speech. Um, <laughs> I mean, the reality is that, uh, who was I talking to you about this? Oh, it was, a, it was a Howie, actually. I don't want to some people that will probably. He was standing in front of the co-op, getting signatures on another, he's running for governor again. And, you know, I, Howie and I have never been real close, but I, I said, you know, I really appreciate your persistence. You know, it's amazing. You know, you've just kept at it. I mean, you know, a lot of us have. And he says, well, it's better than sitting home watching TV. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true. It's, it's, it sounds very simple, but, yeah. you know, it's, it's important that all of us just keep doing as much as you can do. Because it's not going to end. You know, they're not going to. They're not going to throw in the towel and say, oh, God, you guys are right after all. We realized it now. You know, it's finally dawned on us. You know, that's not going to happen. So, you know, we have to keep at it. Uh, and you have to find support wherever you can, whether it's a group or you know, neighbors or whoever you, you know, wherever you find it. Uh, that's really critical because you can't do it yourself. So. <laughs> the other thing is that almost everything that advanced capitalism and the way the system set up says do it yourself. Don't trust anybody else. Being in what we know from choir and other things, that as soon as we're connected, it gives us some kind of hope. So, um, you know, and I would say that as a peacemaker, when one of the things that I've heard about you, like because you were in prison, it gives you a certain, people listen to you. You know, there's a way that they have felt that you did something very, very good you did. So I wonder if we can do some appreciations and then maybe we can end with a song. And a little bit about next week. Next week is our official start of singing. We're going to be doing um, in the next four weeks practicing four songs uh, that we've done before to prepare for this amazing concert in July outside. Um, even if it's just people in this room, we will be doing it. <laughs> so um, please, please come and tell your friends. Shall we do some appreciations? Yeah. And just praise for this very important topic that you know plays us still.
you raise your hand? Well, I want to push out all of this. There you go. <laughs> Uh, Cliff here, I'd like to appreciate that his consistency over the years and the great contributions he's made, even though he probably doesn't even realize it. But with the cultural workers, building that up and making that an ongoing voice for positive change in the world. I, I want to point out that Cliff is so this room for Monday for many years throughout the war was where the Peace Council had a potluck every Monday night to with programming and discussions and again to keep people connected. Um, so Grace Church was really a part of that resistance from that for many years. And guess who organized this week? <laughs> and this is the first place that Holly were staying. She came to a bottle. Other appreciations? We have some from Zoom. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, you can unmute. Did you say me? Yep. Yeah. So, Dick, I know you well, but I didn't know parts of this story. And weaving together all these different parts and all of these different social justice pieces with your, I mean, just totally clear, matter of fact, passion from then, from the mid 60s until tonight. It's just incredible to hear, um, to hear it in, in this way and someone, I think it was Colleen said, this should be a documentary or, or something. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, it was Karen. Yeah, I, I, and I just have so much appreciation, respect and love for this work that you have carried it on <laughs> for decades and decades. Thank you. And I agree with her. <laughs> I love you. Full disclosure, we lived together for 40 years. <laughs> I want to uh, celebrate how much my life has been changed and transformed and never, you know, I've spiraled out from the story. Uh, it was deep, it's real, and I'm still here and I'm so happy. Thank you, Dick, for sharing and Karen and all of us. I'm happy to be here. I, this is Diane. I would also like to really, really appreciate the clarity and um, th this, this story is so important and there's so much we know and so much we don't know. And we learned so much tonight from, from what you had to say. And also, um, Karen always holding up the, the uh, fact that we have to work together and that that's the core and watching this um, teamwork that you ha both have done over so many years is really, really impressive and it showed tonight. So I just appreciate that model so much. The very first thing that we did when we started the Women's Center was a project with the Peace Council when we brought the Indochina Peace Campaign here, and that was with Jane Fonda and Holly Meter and other people. And it was a very big event. Um, so there was a long connection with our, our both of our passions also. As part of that, we distributed 250,000 flyers all over Onondaga County. Mm -hmm. Wow. Against the war. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't just liars. So like uh, 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 um, I think Joan also had her hand raised at some point. Oh. And, and well, I was going to say uh, to have this forum and, and um, also to always remember that the music matters so much. It's so involved and. And it also brings us together, but it 
um, it encapsulates it it expresses uh, the thoughts of the movements and the work so thank you thanks for bringing it all together and then Pauline said in the chat incredible story thank you Dick so much for your talk I learned so much and want to hear more stories like this night these stories need telling a lot of explanation points. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Yeah. I have a, an appreciation. Um, thank you to Teresa for yes. hybridizing this situation. You should turn the camera back on yourself so you can see it. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> we couldn't have done this without you. Um, and thank you to everyone for all of the work you've done for many decades. It's, uh, it's great to hear some details about all of the the work, and I know you say there's not every parallel, but I still think there's a lot of lessons for today. So thank you for your bravery. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say this is, uh, you know, I, Karen, I heard about this. Again, I have never met anybody who existed, you know, with. We voluntarily went to do <laughs> Well, I mean, just, yeah, because, again, these are the things that I was on my mind when I was 16, 17 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, and now right in front of it, anybody who likes to think that, it's just, it's just crazy that you had part of your life taken away like that. You know, I think it's what a problem, but this, right? I don't truly feel my, my life two years of my life was taken away because I you know I, I got to spend time with an incredible incredible bunch of people. Um, as I said earlier, I never would have gotten to know otherwise. Found out that there's a lot of people in prison who are amazing. Of course, you shouldn't have got a prison. I'm sorry. Okay. It's just really wild. Wow. So I guess it's about time to end. Um, how about if we put, as we put the table with chairs back, we say, if I had a hammer, and will lead us to that. that sound? All right, and if you're walking around, you can be clapping. And this one is livelier. So even though we won't be clapping in sync, I will understand that you are clapping. So the words are in the chat. Um, and probably you all know this. And if you don't, you'll pick it up. So here we go. If I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the mall. 